This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Moira Fogarty. Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy, Part 1, Chapter 11. Next morning, which was Sunday, she resumed operations about ten o'clock and the renewed work recalled the conversation which had accompanied it the night before, and put her back into the same intractable temper. "'That's the story about me and Mary Green, is it? That I entrapped ye? Much of a catch you were, Lord Send!' As she warmed, she saw some of Jude's dear ancient classics on a table, where they ought not to have been laid. "'I won't have them books here in the way,' she cried petulantly, and seizing them one by one, she began throwing them upon the floor." "'Leave my books alone,' he said. "'You might have thrown them aside if you had liked, "'but as to soiling them like that, it is disgusting.' "'In the operation of making lard, "'Arabella's hands had become smeared with the hot grease, "'and her fingers consequently left very perceptible imprints on the book covers. "'She continued deliberately to toss the book severally upon the floor, "'till Jude, incensed beyond bearing, "'caught her by the arms to make her leave off.' Somehow, in doing so, he loosened the fastening of her hair, and it rolled about her ears. "'Let me go!' she said. "'Promise to leave the books alone.' She hesitated. "'Let me go!' she repeated. "'Promise!' After a pause, "'I do.' Jude relinquished his hold, and she crossed the room to the door, out of which she went with a set face and into the highway. Here she began to saunter up and down, perversely pulling her hair into a worse disorder than he had caused, and unfastening several buttons of her gown. It was a fine Sunday morning, dry, clear, and frosty, and the bells of Alfredston Church could be heard on the breeze from the north. People were going along the road, dressed in their holiday clothes. They were mainly lovers, such pairs as Jude and Arabella had been when they sported along the same track some months earlier. These pedestrians turned to stare at the extraordinary spectacle she now presented, bonnetless, her dishevelled hair blowing in the wind, her bodice apart, her sleeves rolled above her elbows for work, and her hands reeking with melted fat. One of the passers said in mock terror, "'Good Lord, deliver us!' "'See how he served me!' she cried, "'making me work Sunday mornings when I ought to be going to my church, and tearing my hair off my head, and my gown off my back!' Jude was exasperated, and went out to drag her in by main force. Then he suddenly lost his heat, illuminated with the sense that all was over between them, and that it mattered not what she did, or he, her husband, stood still, regarding her. Their lives were ruined, he thought, ruined by the fundamental error of their matrimonial union, that of having based a permanent contract on a temporary feeling which had no necessary connection with affinities that alone render a lifelong comradeship tolerable. "'Going to ill-use me on principle, as your father ill-used your mother, and your father's sister ill-used her husband?' she asked. "'All you be a queer lot as husbands and wives.' Jude fixed an arrested, surprised look on her, but she said no more, and continued her saunter till she was tired. He left the spot, and, after wandering vaguely a little while, walked in the direction of Mary Green. Here he called upon his great-aunt, whose infirmities daily increased. "'Aunt, did my father ill-use my mother and my aunt her husband?' said Jude abruptly, sitting down by the fire. She raised her ancient eyes under the rim of the bygone bonnet that she always wore. "'Who's been telling you that?' she said. "'I have heard it spoken of, and want to know all.' "'You med so well, I suppose, though your wife, I reckon twas she, must have been a fool to open up that. "'There isn't much to know, after all. Your father and mother couldn't get on together, and they parted. "'It was coming home from Alfredston Market, when you were a baby, on the hill by the Brown House barn, "'that they had their last difference and took leave of one another for the last time. "'Your mother soon afterwards died. She drowned herself, in short.' "'and your father went away with you to South Wessex "'and never came here any more.' "'Jude recalled his father's silence "'about North Wessex and Jude's mother, "'never speaking of either till his dying day. "'It was the same with your father's sister. "'Her husband defended her, "'and she so disliked living with him afterwards 
that she went away to London with her little maid. The follies were not made for wedlock. It never seemed to sit well upon us. There's summit in our blood that won't take kindly to the notion of being bound to do what we do readily enough if not bound. That's why you ought to have hearkened to me, and not ha' married. Where did father and mother part? By the brown house, did you say? A little further on, where the road to Fensworth branches off and the handpost stands. A gibbet once stood there, not unconnected with our history, but let that be. In the dusk of that evening Jude walked away from his old aunt's as if to go home. But as soon as he reached the open down he struck out upon it till he came to a large round pond. The frost continued, though it was not particularly sharp, and the larger stars overhead came out slow and flickering. Jude put one foot on the edge of the ice, and then the other. It cracked under his weight, but this did not deter him. He ploughed his way inward to the centre, the ice making sharp noises as he went. When just about the middle he looked around him and gave a jump. The cracking repeated itself, but he did not go down. He jumped again, but the cracking had ceased. Jude went back to the edge and stepped upon the ground. It was curious, he thought. What was he reserved for? He supposed he was not a sufficiently dignified person for suicide. Peaceful death abhorred him as a subject and would not take him. What could he do of a lower kind than self-extermination? What was there less noble, more in keeping with his present degraded position? He could get drunk. Of course, that was it, he had forgotten. Drinking was the regular stereotyped resource of the despairing worthless. He began to see now why some men boozed at inns. He struck down the hill northwards and came to an obscure public house. On entering and sitting down, the sight of the picture of Samson and Delilah on the wall caused him to recognize the place as that he had visited with Arabella on that first Sunday evening of their courtship. He called for liquor and drank briskly for an hour or more. Staggering homeward late that night, with all his sense of depression gone and his head fairly clear still, he began to laugh boisterously and to wonder how Arabella would receive him in his new aspect. The house was in darkness when he entered, and in his stumbling state it was some time before he could get a light. Then he found that, though the marks of pig-dressing, of fats and scallops, were visible, the materials themselves had been taken away. A line written by his wife on the inside of an old envelope was pinned to the cotton blower of the fireplace. "'Have gone to my friends. Shall not return.' All the next day he remained at home and sent off the carcass of the pig to Alfredston. He then cleaned up the premises, locked the door, put the key in a place she would know if she came back, and returned to his masonry at Alfredston. At night, when he again plodded home, he found she had not visited the house. The next day went in the same way, and the next. Then there came a letter from her. That she had grown tired of him, she frankly admitted. He was such a slow old coach, and she did not care for the sort of life he led. There was no prospect of his ever bettering himself or her. She further went on to say that her parents had, as he knew, for some time considered the question of emigrating to Australia, the pig-jobbing business being a poor one nowadays. They had at last decided to go, and she proposed to go with them if he had no objection. A woman of her sort would have more chance over there than in this stupid country. Jude replied that he had not the least objection to her going. He thought it a wise course, since she wished to go, and one that might be to the advantage of both. He enclosed in the packet containing the letter the money that had been realized by the sale of the pig, with all he had besides, which was not much. From that day he heard no more of her, except indirectly, though her father and his household did not immediately leave, but waited till his goods and other effects had been sold off. When Jude learnt that there was to be an auction at the house of the Dons, he packed his own household goods into a wagon, and sent them to her at the aforesaid homestead, that she might sell them with the rest, or as many of them as she should choose. He then went into lodgings at Alfredston, and saw in a shop window the little handbill announcing the sale of his father-in-law's furniture. He noted its date, which came and passed without Jude's going near the place, or perceiving that the traffic out of Alfredston by the southern road was materially increased by the auction. 
A few days later he entered a dinghy broker's shop in the main street of the town, and amid a heterogeneous collection of saucepans, a clothes horse, rolling pin, brass candlestick, swing looking glass, and other things at the back of the shop, evidently just brought in from a sale, he perceived a framed photograph which turned out to be his own portrait. It was one which he had had specially taken and framed by a local man in Bird's Eye Maple, as a present for Arabella, and had duly given her on their wedding day. On the back was still to be read, Jude to Arabella, with the date. She must have thrown it in with the rest of her property at the auction. "'Oh,' said the broker, seeing him look at this and the other articles in the heap, and not perceiving that the portrait was of himself. "'It is a small lot of stuff that was knocked down to me at a cottage sale, out on the road to Mary Green. The frame is a very useful one if you take out the likeness. You shall have it for a shilling.' The utter death of every tender sentiment in his wife, as brought home to him by this mute and undesigned evidence of her sale of his portrait and gift, was the conclusive little stroke required to demolish all sentiment in him. He paid the shilling, took the photograph away with him, and burnt it, frame and all, when he reached his lodging. Two or three days later he heard that Arabella and her parents had departed. He had sent a message offering to see her for a formal leave-taking, but she had said that it would be better otherwise, since she was bent on going, which perhaps was true. On the evening following their emigration, when his day's work was done, he came out of doors after supper and strolled in the starlight along the too familiar road towards the upland, whereon had been experienced the chief emotions of his life. It seemed to be his own again. He could not realize himself. On the old track he seemed to be a boy still, hardly a day older than when he had stood dreaming at the top of that hill, inwardly fired for the first time with ardours for Christminster and scholarship. "'Yet I am a man,' he said. "'I have a wife. More, I have arrived at the still riper stage of having disagreed with her, disliked her, had a scuffle with her, and parted from her.' He remembered then that he was standing not far from the spot at which the parting between his father and mother was said to have occurred. A little further on was the summit whence Christminster, or what he had taken for that city, had seemed to be visible. A milestone, now as always, stood at the roadside hard by. Jude drew near it, and felt rather than read the mileage to the city. He remembered that once on his way home he had proudly cut with his keen new chisel an inscription on the back of that milestone, embodying his aspirations. It had been done in the first week of his apprenticeship, before he had been diverted from his purposes by an unsuitable woman. He wondered if the inscription were legible still, and going to the back of the milestone brushed away the nettles. By the light of a match he could still discern what he had cut so enthusiastically so long ago. Thither, J. F., and a pointing hand. The sight of it unimpaired, within its screen of grass and nettles, lit in his soul a spark of the old fire. Surely his plan should be to move onward through good and ill, to avoid morbid sorrow, even though he did see ugliness in the world. Bene agere et laetari, to do good cheerfully, which he had heard to be the philosophy of one Spinoza, might be his own even now. He might battle with his evil star, and follow out his original intention. By moving to a spot a little way off, he uncovered the horizon in a northeasterly direction. There actually rose the faint halo, a small dim nebulousness, hardly recognizable save by the eye of faith. It was enough for him. He would go to Christminster as soon as the term of his apprenticeship expired. He returned to his lodgings in a better mood, and said his prayers. End of chapter 11 and end of part 1 Recorded in Toronto, Ontario by Moira Fogarty, October 2006